Hello, this is Cecilia with Kentucky Rose Devotionals, where we're finding the roses in the Word of God. Today is November the 22nd, and it is Friday, and I missed you yesterday. Um, um, but I am continuing on. I've been praying about what to do next um, and, and what direction to go. And today I felt in my spirit that people needed to re- be reminded of, of waiting on the Lord and trusting in Him and finding joy and finding thanksgiving um, in this season that we're in. We're headed up to Thanksgiving um, where many people will get together um, with their family and friends and and those they love and just get to celebrate um, a holiday that I think is so special just for the fact because it's just about being together it's just about family it was probably one of my my dad's favorite holidays and my mom's as well um, to because there's just nothing involved except just getting together and and gathering and loving one another and that's what um, family is all about and the family of God and so take this opportunity this week um, as you gather uh, together with your family to number one be grateful that you have um, all of those places around the table don't ever take that for granted and the second thing I would encourage you to do is to gather together and pray. Pray for our country. Pray for your family. Pray that the hedge of God would be around you, that your eyes would be open to the things of God, and that your your mind would be ready to receive um, the things that God has in store for you and your family in this new year. Um, that you would, would prepare your heart to receive it. That you would prepare your heart and make Him room um, in this season. So after uh, Tuesday or after Thanksgiving is over with, um, I'll be coming back to you. I'm going to take time to be with my family next week. And, and do some things with them and enjoy my time um, with family. Um, but I'll be coming back to you um, after Thanksgiving on that Monday um, after. And we will begin a series of Christmas carols and the stories behind them. So um, I believe the stories behind them will help you. We're going to take the, uh, the gospel perspective on these carols because um, that's what it comes from. Carol actually comes from the word circle or dance um, because the many of the people as they sang these songs would dance with their family and rejoice over the good news which is the gospel of Jesus Christ that's what it's all about um, to, to go and tell so I'm going to give you lots of ways for you to go and tell and to encourage yourself in the Lord um, leading up to the days of Christmas so I will come back to you I will have some uh, recorded d- devotions that I'll be doing for next week just on Monday and Tuesday maybe when Wednesday, we'll see, and then um, I'll see you back again on the following Monday. So I'm going to take some time off to to enjoy being um, with my family and enjoying um, the precious stories um, that we'll get to share when we get together. So I'm looking forward to that, um, and I hope that you get to look forward to that same thing. If you haven't reached out to a family member, this is the time to do it. If you haven't went home for a while, this is the time to do it. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised another Thanksgiving or another Christmas. So don't, don't, don't take it for granted. Don't take for granted anything that God has blessed you with, especially your family, especially your children. Don't take it for granted. That's all I can say. Don't take it for granted. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about Thanksgiving. And um, I think there is so much joy and thanksgiving in the book of Philippians. Even though this was a book that was written in a prison cell by Paul, um, he, he carried the hope of Christ even in the prison cell. And he was praying and seeking God even though he was facing the greatest probably adversity that he'd ever faced in his life. He was still glorying in Christ. He was still glorying in what God would do through him and in him. And I want to start in Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 today um, where, where Paul just, just reminds those that are reading this prison epistle um, that he has been praying for them. That what he's faced, he's faced it because of his love for God. He's faced it because of the things that he has he's spoken out against. And that he would rather, he says here, um, have what happened to him happen this way. I'd rather suffer for Christ 
than not to suffer and, and continue on the road that I was on before this. So he says, But I would that you understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. You know, we, we may think that the things that are happening to us are just by coincidence, that um, that they're just happening, that bad things are happening or good things are happening and it rains on the just and the unjust. We, we hear this all the time. But Paul was under the, the frame of mind that whatever happens to me is not an accident. Whatever happens to me is, is divine appointments that God is taking me to to further the gospel. And if we all looked at, at things that way, especially looking at suffering that way, but that's what he was looking at. He said that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Because I'm bound for, for Christ, for, for the cause of Christ, um, I can rejoice in this. He said that many of the brethren in the Lord were waxing confident. They were more bold because of the fact that he was in bonds. They had the boldness to speak the words without fear. Because of him taking his stand. Because of him saying, I will be, I will go, Lord. Send me. I'll go. I'll respond to your call. I won't abandon the call. I won't run from the call. I will run to you, God. I will do what you're asking from me. He says, Indeed, preach Christ, even of envy and strife, some also of goodwill. Some some people preach Christ for envy and strife. Some preach him for goodwill. He said, The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Some people that claim to be Christians add more affliction and more bonds to Christian than they do to release them because they're living in hypocrisy. And that's what Paul was exposing here, saying, you know, there there are people who call themselves Christians who are causing more affliction to me than they are causing um, of good things to happen, and and that that's a shame to be said, isn't it? He says, but of the other love, knowing that I am set, he set, he says, for the defense of the gospel, I'm set. I have to be set in the truth of God. I have to be set in what God has spoken, and I and I act on it. I do what God tells me to do, um, because I know that He's got me. He's He's my defense attorney. He knows what I'm doing in the dark. He knows what I'm doing in the light. Paul's saying here, He's my defense. He says, what then, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pre tense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therefore do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. As long as Christ is being preached, I have reason to rejoice. And I have the honor to be a part of that. Praise God, all of us have that opportunity today to be a part, to, to preach Christ, to do what he's called us to do today. He says at verse 19, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We all need to be praying. We all need to be interceding on behalf of those that we know that are running from God. Those who are not in the, the Spirit but are in the flesh. We need to pray that the Spirit of God overtake our loved ones that are lost. We need to pray that the Spirit of God overtake these these difficult situations that we're facing. That, that the truth would be manifest and brought to light. He says, according to my earnest expectation. Do you have an expectation today that Jesus Christ will meet your need right where you are today. Do you expect him to do it? Have you got your table set? Have you got things prepared? Are things in order? He says, because I have this earnest expectation and he's my hope. Jesus is my hope. I don't hope in people. I don't hope in the words that I speak, but I hope in God's word that nothing I shall be ashamed. I won't be ashamed if I'm doing what God's telling me to do. But if I'm against what God's telling me to do, then I have reason to be ashamed. But but Paul was saying, I'm not. I'm doing what God has called me to do, and therefore I can do it with boldness. God gives us a boldness when we do things for him. He says, and always, so now Christ shall be magnified in my body. Let that be said of us today. Let that be said of us over the next several days as we go forward, leading up into a time of gathering with our family to give thanks, that Christ would be magnified in what we say and what we do around that table. Praise God. Let Christ be magnified in us. If anything else is being magnified, then it's not what we need. He says, whether it be my life or by my death, I'd rather magnify Christ in what I'm doing and saying than to magnify something else, my wants and, and wicked things that have nothing to do with God. He's saying, I want Christ to be exhibited in me. You know, I think of a magnifying glass. When a magnifying glass is put up against something, it really shows you what it really is. You know, when we're magnified, when we magnify ourselves. We're not going to draw people to God, but when Christ shines out of us, when he's magnified, 
when he's lifted up, when he's enlarged in our life, then good things are going to happen. No matter life, no come, come life, come death, good things are happening. He says, for to me to live, to live is Christ. To die is gain. How can that be true? How can you gain anything when you're dead? Because if I've died in Christ, I've gained heaven. I've gained an eternal home. I've gained a place that I know that I will never, ever have to worry again. Because that's the hope of Christ in me. The hope of Christ is knowing that I am saved. I am sanctified. I am set apart, filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled to do His, His service, His will. Nothing else trumps that. Nothing comes over what I'm to do for God. And if if I'm being steered away from the calling of God, if I'm being steered away from Christ being magnified in me, if I'm being steered away from things that that are making me better, making me stronger, but I'm being steered to things that are that are not making me stronger. You know, the word of God says a companion of fools is going to be destroyed. You know, I don't want to be a, comp a companion with fools. I don't want to be uh, a friend with people who speak foolish things and are not encouraging me to do the right things, to do the right things I need to do. So we need to listen to the voices that we're, we're listening to. Who are we listening to? Are we listening to the voice of the Word, which Paul was telling them to do here? He's saying, I'm listening to Christ. I'm, I'm wanting Him to be magnified in me. I'm listening to what He would tell me to do above all other voices. His voice is has priority. His voice trumps all other voices. He says at verse 22, But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. I don't want to do the things that I choose because my flesh may choose wrong. I want to do the things that I know that, that the Spirit tells me and leads me to do. And I'm obligated to do it out of my love for God, out of my love for my family, out of my love for, for doing the right things of God, to have that thankful heart. He says, I'm in a strait between the two, desiring to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. We all know heaven is far better than this life. Or to abide here in the flesh, which is more needful for you. Paul said, I, I want to be here for you. I want to help you. I want to be a voice of truth to you. But I also desire to go to heaven. I desire to make heaven my home. And that's far better. But I'll, I'll do whatever the will of God is, he says here. I have this confidence, he says. I know that I shall abide and continue with you for the furtherance of joy of faith. That's what we're all here to do. We're here to further the kingdom of God. And you have to ask yourself today, and I have to ask myself today, what am I doing today to do that? What, how are my, my words, my actions, my behavior furthering the kingdom of God? How am I doing that with my life, with my words, with how I treat people? How am I, how am I confirming that Christ is in me? He says to rejoice and that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. He says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. Let what you speak be what becomes God. If God was listening and sitting with you while you speak, would he like what you say? Would he like what you say when, when it's just you and him? Would he like what you say when it's just you and, and other people that approve of the things that you're doing, but maybe God doesn't approve of those things? So we got to realize, who, who are we listening to? And what are we, who are we letting approve us to do what we're doing? He says, I hear of your affairs, whether I'm absent or I'm there. Um, you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is what we're to do. You need to strive with people who are furthering the gospel in you, who are building up the good things in you, that are encouraging you in the good things of God. He says, nothing is terrified by your adversities, which or your adversaries, which is to them an evidence token of perdition, but to you of salvation, that is of God. So, we, we, we have to watch. We have to watch who we surround ourselves with to know that there are adversaries. The enemy has sent adversaries. He has sent people into your life for one reason or another. They're either to build you up and further you in the gospel or they're to tear you down and tear you away from what God has chosen you to do. 
And you have to decide. You have to make a decision. As Moses said, whose side will you be on? Who, who, Whose side are you going to choose? Are you going to come to be with the people of God? Or are you going to choose to go down a road that leads you farther and farther and farther away from the purposes of God, he says. But having this same conflict which you saw in me now here to be in me. There's always a conflict in us. That conflict is, is, is the world versus God. It is the flesh versus the spirit. It is thankfulness versus complaining and moaning and groaning. It's bitterness versus love. It's forgiveness versus unforgiveness. These, these two, two things are always offered to us, heaven or hell, life or death. And we have to decide which one we will choose today. Who will you choose? Which, who will you serve this day, says the Lord? Are you willing to wait on what God has for you? Are you are you going to continue to kick down doors that God didn't open? In this time of Thanksgiving, we need to look at all God has blessed us with and in His perfect timing, accept what He's given. And as we do that, as we accept with thanksgiving, God, you blessed me with these things. God, you blessed me with my finances. You blessed me with my family. God, everything you've given me, God, don't let me want things that are not from you. But God, let me be content. Let me be happy with what you've already done. And God, even if you don't intervene even if you don't intervene the way I expect you to or the things that I'm praying, God, don't come to pass as I thought they would. God, we know that you have a bigger picture that you see today, that we have the opportunity today to give you thanks and to give you praise even when we don't see what you're doing, God. You know, I think about Lazarus and I think about Mary and Martha. I think about um, that story of, of how Jesus came four days it seemed four days late and there's a beautiful song about it that I love but you know we think that you know we wonder why God why haven't you intervened some of you out there may be praying as I am for things to take place things to be restored things to be done correctly and in order and right and and made right and and God is a God of justice and I want you to know that today God sees he hears he knows what you're facing he knows what you're going through he hears the prayers you've prayed day and night he he sees your tears he hears your, your cries to him. He's not lost sight of us. And I think the amazing part in, in that story is Mary was the one who took her hair and she washed the feet of, of Jesus with her hair. She dried his feet with her tears and, and washed them with her tears and, and dried them with her hair. And she was there worshiping Jesus in that moment when no one else would worship. When others were busy doing what they do and caught up in the moment of serving dinner, which is what Martha was caught up doing. She was caught up in, in the serving. She was caught up in, in the busyness. And, and Jesus said to her, you know, you, you, Mary has found the good part. She is, she is worshiping me. You, you're busy, Martha, about many things. But Mary has found the important thing. She's, she's come to just worship me. She's come to listen. She's come to hear me. She's come to, to, to lay at my feet. Uh, and, and I believe that's what Jesus is calling all of us to do. But I, I find it funny that after all of that took place with Mary and Martha, that when Lazarus died, Mary wasn't the one there worshiping Jesus. It was Martha. Martha was there. And Martha came running to Jesus. And where was Mary? Uh, the Bible tells us that Mary was still at the house. She didn't come running to Jesus like she did the first time. Why do you think that was? I think I think it was because Mary had had worshipped at the feet of Jesus. She loved Jesus. She'd, she'd found the important thing of Jesus there. But then when her brother died, the, the enemy crept in and placed some doubt inside her mind. Placed in her, doubt in her heart. And, and she was hurt, I think. And, and she was hurting and grieving so much over the death of her brother, the death of this thing that she thought she had, 
you know, that, that Jesus would never let her brother die. That Jesus, you know, some of you out there may be thinking that, why did Jesus let this happen? Why did this go this far? How did I get here? What? How? Why did this happen? Why was this taken from me? How was this, this and this and this? We go through all these things in our mind and the devil causes bitterness to wrap around our heart and he causes doubt to wrap into our mind instead of doing what we should continue to do that Mary did at first she worshipped Jesus without question she knew who he was she knew that she was worshipping at the feet of the Son of God and that in that moment everything was fine everything was alright and that same thing will be true for you and me if we continue to have faith and trust and Martha at this point, the one who had been so busy spoke up and said, But Lord, I know. <laughs> I know you can do all things. I know there's nothing that's too hard for you. Even now, God, you can take care of this. Her faith spoke. Even though she had been a busy little lady and hadn't worshipped, I think she'd learned a lesson. She'd learned a lesson in her busyness that she realized that Jesus was worthy of worship. Whether he did it or he didn't do it, she still loved him. She still was going to worship him. She still was going to serve him. She still was going to do what he, he asked from her and, he, and, and did. I like the way Elizabeth Elliot puts this. This is from her book, The Music of His Promises, which is one of my favorite books. And she put it this way. She says, Lazarus was sick. His sister sent word to Jesus, sure that he would immediately come and heal him. But Jesus didn't budge. So it happens sometimes with us. We are in urgent need of God's help. We ask for it. It does not come. We easily conclude that God is not listening or that he does not care about our concerns or that all our promises of his love have been broken down. Read the story in John 11. Though he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after hearing of his illness, Jesus waited two more days loving and waiting the two things that do not seem to go together nor in the middle of our particular situation but the story lights up a facet that we would miss the glory of God is wrought through suffering and death which are strictly temporary God is engineering things we can hardly dream of Lazarus story opens our eyes he was indeed very ill and Martha and Mary were desperate. He died, but then Jesus came. Lazarus' resurrection revealing the authority of God over the worst powers at work in our world shows us his glory. Can we pray for a literal resurrection like Lazarus? In God's time, in God's time, he will do it. Someday his glory will be revealed because of the thing we are desperate about. Remember, it is because he loves us that he waits. Immediate intervention would abort the far greater thing that God has in mind. Trust him for the greater. Trust is hard, isn't it? But it's not if you know who he is. If you've proved him. And I have proved God many, many times in my life. And he has never failed me in all these years. And I don't believe that he's going to fail us now. I don't believe he's going to start to fail now because that's the one thing God can't do is fail. So I want to encourage you today to trust God's timing, to trust that he knows best and that he will do what must be done in his way to bring glory to his name. God has called us all to provoke each other to good works, to do good for God. And that's what I would encourage you to do this week. Be, don't be provoked by anger. Don't be provoked by bitterness and wrath. And don't be provoked by the past. But instead, be provoked by God to do good for those who have misused you, abused you, mistreated you, lied on you. Because that's what Jesus did. And we're going to see that farther good come out. Whatever that good is, we know in Romans it tells us all things work together for good. To who? To those who love God, who are called according to His purposes. You and I, if we're, if we're doing good, if we're doing the good things of God, if we're walking in the ways of God, if we're His children, then He has 
a bound word that he will bring good out of the bad that we face the things that we go through, the trials that we go through. So trust Him today and believe that through a thankful heart today that God will provoke you to do good works for Jesus Christ and that good things are bound to happen when you do that. God bless you. If this has helped you today, please like, share, subscribe. We'd love to have you join us on this journey. We'll be seeing you soon.